This is Hope McGonigal from DODD. We're going to do a webinar today on the cost report, I'm going to call it a toolbox folder, out at the, our data warehouse. Um, I'm here with a couple other folks. Let's just say hi. Hi, this is Laurel, Skype. Yeah. This is Coy Widener. I'll be doing some of the uh, demo in here in a moment. So if you have any questions, or comments or anything as you go through, go ahead and submit them using either your chat box or your question box, and we'll be able to answer them as we go through. Uh, I'm going to just go ahead and turn this over to Clay. He's going to go through these folders or the, the reports that he has put together here, <laughs> and uh, at the end when he's done, and we don't really expect it probably to go the whole time unless you have a bunch of questions, which are fine. Uh, but you can ask questions about anything Data Warehouse once he is finished with his stuff. We're going to take a seat so he can drive. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Clay Widener. If you don't know me, um, I am the currently the cost report coordinator, among other things. Um, and one of the things we wanted to do with the uh, with, with today's session is if, if some of you, I know many of you anyways, went to the uh, cost report um, training we would have done uh, in March, I believe. And as part of that training, we quickly, because we didn't really have time to really go into detail, we quickly showed some of these reports that we developed to hopefully help uh, you with um, cost report preparation and also about mon monitoring certain things because that's what the auditor of state will look at when they um, come out and do do your audits okay so hopefully these reports are helpful we're always you know thinking of other reports that could be helpful so obviously if you think of some that um, you know may be of some benefit to preparing the cost report you know obviously let us know um, and we can see about creating those um, and the feasibility of some of that stuff uh, okay, well, I'll just get started again. As Hope said, if you have any questions, uh, you know, you can do it through the chat box. You know, we'll monitor that and we'll hopefully address them uh, that way. So, looks like you can see my screen here. Uh, I'm not going to show you how to log into the warehouse. There's some tool tips out on the website and YouTube videos that can show you how to do that if, if you don't know how to do that yet. Um, but assuming you do, basically, if you go in here to your, um, you log in. See all your folders. I don't know that you. I don't think you guys can see all the ones we can see. So yours is probably a less. If you can, you need to let us know. Yeah, there you go. Hope, if you didn't hear, Hope said if you can't see all these, let us know because you shouldn't. Um, so your screen's probably much less busier than ours. Um, but basically, you're going to click on standard reports, and you'll see that there's a folder right here that I've kind of highlighted. It's called cost report preparation. If you click that, you'll then see, and this is for security purposes, but you'll see two separate folders and underneath underneath each of these folders are you know a, re a report or reports um, that will help to the cost report preparation okay so I'm going to go into claims first so there are four key reports here from our claims package that we've used to kind of help um, the cost report um, preparation the first one here is um, the adult adult you services um, the adult day services 15 minute units per day. I'm just going to run this and show you the prompt page first. Basically, as I'm sure many of you know, you know one of the things the auditor of state will look at when they come to your uh, county to do your cost report audits is obviously they'll look at the claims. Um, but one of the things they'll look for is any time that you have billed for a person more than 32 units in a day for day services. Obviously, 32 units is eight hours. Um, now, that doesn't mean it's wrong, okay? So you can bill more than 32 15-minute units per day for a person. However, we found that in most cases it is uh, incorrect that the county either billed the wrong code or something to that matter, okay? So um, this is a report that can hopefully help you monitor these things and research them well before Auditor of State ever comes to your place to do an audit, all right? So here, if you were to click the prompt page, you'll see the only required prompt is it asks you the number of units greater than, all right? 
So in theory, if you wanted to run this port for any time somebody had an adult day service um, uh, payment for a day greater than 32 units, you just put 32 in there, okay? And then you can run it for your service date. Yours are always, if you're doing it for the cost report, it's going to be a calendar year. If you're going to monitor this regularly, which I would suggest that you do, it could be any time span. But let's just say you're doing it for your report you're working on now, which would be calendar year 14. You know, you're going to pick January 1 of 14 to December 31st of 14. And it's going to be based on service date, okay? And for you, you shouldn't have to put in a contract number because your security should limit you to only the con your contract number as a provider. Um, if you see more than your contract number, you need to let us know, but uh, you should only see your contract number. For me, I'd have to pick what county I'd want to run. And I'm not going to run it because it's going to show HIPAA-related information, but I'm going to show you a, a redacted copy here in a second. So basically, you'd run this, and it would show you um, any person that had a uh, adult day 15-minute unit greater than 30. So here's an actual example of a report. We blacked out the HIPAA information here. So if we run this, you'd actually see the, who the Medicaid number is, the DOD number, and the individual name. But it's going to show you by person the service date, and it's going to show you the number of units. Now, we ran this actually, as you can see in the heading, for ones greater than 30. So one person might have, like here, like for example, if you can see my screen here, this person had four dates where they had greater than 30 units. And you can actually see here it was much greater than um, 30. So, or this person here had actually 64 units. So obviously that would flag an interesting thing to have uh, over 16 hours of adult day services provided on one service date. Um, that's a high likelihood of billing error, right? Um, as you can see, the billing system doesn't look by day. It's not going to cap anything. Um, pause, I mean. So this is something you, that you guys can monitor. This, If I were you, this would flag me to look at this particular claim and make sure that we build it correctly. Um, and if we didn't, to go back and fix it well within the time window I have to actually correct it. All right? The good thing is if you, this is Excel so I can show you, but if you, the default of the report is HTML, which simply means it's going to run on your screen right here. It's not going to download a report. It's going to run on your screen. The benefit of doing that is, if you can see these highlighted blue but these blue links, it will allow you to drill down into the detail without you having to do anything else. So for example, if I, if I looked at this one and I thought this looked strange and I ran it in HTML, I could click the 1231.14 and it's going to go into a detailed report that will give me the detailed claims for that person for that date for the 15-minute unit service code. So I think we've got an example here. So this is what it would look like. So if you clicked it for one particular thing, um, you're going to see all the claims, you know, the ITN, all the good stuff, the dates they were approved, all the detail basically for the claims for that person. So that should give you everything that's available to then, you know, look at the detail and the actual um, uh, impact. Now, as you can see here, I'm glad actually this, this is a good example. And sometimes you can see this that, like for example, this isn't this drill down, but if you click this one, it could be that you've already backed out some of these claims, they just haven't run through yet and got an actual uh, voucher run date or an adjudication date. But it's something that you can check. So in other words, if you hadn't done anything, it could correct itself if you're already on top of it and identified the error through other means. Okay, so the recommendation here would be, you know, to have someone, whether it's the business manager, the billing person, whoever, to regularly monitor, you know, this report to look for anomalies um, because auditor state will. So they're going to start. They will run this report. They will get the information and they will look at uh, claims like this to make sure everything's on the up and up. I have a question, Clay. Yeah. Uh, so this report is built using the is it the claims or policy utilization package? It, it would be used the claims package. Claims package. So could a county board, if they wanted to sort of monitor what uh, providers, not their own stuff, but other providers that, you know, they're uh, having people, you know, the providers on other people's waivers, they could put in a contract number for any provider 
that someone is on a call for in their county and they could pull back that information, couldn't they? Um, uh, they could at the pause utilization level. I don't know that they could see the detail of the claims by contract number. We'd have to check on the security. Okay. Um, but definitely on the at the higher level, mm -hmm. definitely. Uh, I don't see any questions on this from the county folks. Um, so the next one I'll show you, which is going to be very similar, similar concept, okay, is non-medical transportation trips per day. Um, again, the exact same con concept as the one we just went over with the adult day. Again, outer of state, when they come to your county, is, is going to look at or is going to get have information to look at any time non-medical transportation trips for one person was billed more than three times. Again, there's nothing in the rule that precludes someone having more than two or three trips per day. However, it, oftentimes we find that most of the, in those cases is theirs. Or a board is, or board or providers billing for field trips within the day services, which, uh, and also the uh, adult day service, which is a no-no. Um, so anytime we've, we've seen that happen, that's almost always the case, is they were billing non-medical transportation and adult day at the same time for the same person, which is not allowed by the rule. So this will, this report, exactly just like the other one, has the exact same prompt, you can put in three. So this report, if you run this, would show any time by service date by person that someone had more um, than, in this case, three or whatever number you put in here, trips per day paid for and, and claimed. And two is the typical, what yes. you expect a day. Exactly. Two. It would be, yeah, two is kind of the, you know, the, the softball one, but AOS will look at anything greater than three. So you can guarantee AOS will, will look at a report that has greater than three and probably pick a sample to see if, um, if it's actually accurate. So just like the last time, uh, here's, here's an example. Ironically, we picked an egregious number, which would be 40 in one day. And as you can see, we actually have some, um, which would obviously flag to me that somebody meant to bill per mile and bill per trip. All right, so they bill the wrong service code. So this would be something that, again, as a provider, as a board, as a provider, I would be monitoring my claims to make sure I'm not I'm doing the correct code, um, but also as a you know user of you know or an overseer if you will of private providers, I would also be monitoring this type of stuff for private providers as well to make sure they're doing the right code, because this is going to pay nineteen dollars times forty eight trips instead of fifty cents times forty eight, huge difference right. Um, so again, this is just a tool that doesn't mean what the report shows is incorrect. It's just a monitoring tool um, for you to have, you know, to monitor your claims and all that good stuff, and also to know that AOS is going to look at it. So, you know, you might as well be monitoring it because they're going to as well. Okay? But, again, same thing. If you click here on the, it's not blue in here, but same deal, you're going you're to get the drill down, exact same information you got that I just showed you, the actual detailed claims level for what was billed for that person for that service date for those codes. Okay. Um, the next report is right here. It says TCM claims after individual date of death. Um, so one thing we've got going on right now is um, for um, AOS is found, and I think there will be some guidance just to remind folks soon, um, where Boards are billing TCM for services that occur after someone has died. Okay. Um, now, those might be legitimate SSA services, you know, closing up a case, whatever. Um, however, you can't bill TCM for those things. Uh, a person's Medicaid eligibility actually ends the day they die. Um, so, although you may have to do that stuff, you can't bill TCM for it. Okay. So, that, you know, that's coming up quite a bit now. Um, and AOS has found um, quite a few examples of that. So we created this report that, again, is similar to this. We'll, we'll show the detail for anybody that has a paid TCM claim that's after the date of death. We have their date of death in the data warehouse, so we're able to add that to it. Um, here, again, if you just want to know what you build, you don't, you know, the only required prompt is usually anything with this orange asterisk kind of star, which is asking you for a date span. So again, if I'm monitoring, if I if 
I've got AOS coming in or if I'm looking at my 2014 report, I'm simply just going to take do my time span to be 2014 and I can hit finish um, and it's going to give me you know a total of anybody that, that that's applicable. If you get if it's blank, that means you don't have any. Um, so let me show you here what it looks like. Again, we have a redacted copy here. So this is what's going to show. It's going to show the detail here. So you can see for this particular person, um, you know, you got a date of death of 9-22-13. You have a service date of 9-25-13. Okay. So they died the 22nd, and somebody billed TCM two days later um, for services that occurred two days after death. Again, the reason why I got paid likely is because there's always a huge timing difference between the ending of the eligibility spans and the actual date of death. I mean, we've seen as much as six months before ultimately people get their their span ended and all the all the paperwork gets and done. The date of death entered into our system. Yeah, and the date of death entered in our system. So there can be a huge gap there. So you know, it it will and often does get paid. Um, However, it's something that you can retroactively monitor, and obviously there will be some guidance soon that will say, hey, you know, guys, we, we can't be billing for this, just to remind folks. Um, but again, this is a tool for you to run this, go back, back out the claims, so you don't have to worry about AOS drawing up a bunch of findings on you when they come, because they will get the same information, and they will. All right? So it's going to behoove you to, um, to pick that up. Uh, let's see. Oh, I just got a question here. It says, "Why, why does the date of death not automatically roll from the MUI?" Actually, it does. Um, it all comes from the same source when we actually get the date of death, but that can obvi that's obviously uh, takes a long time as well. It's not automatic. It depends. You know, it depends on whether they're uh, sometimes they're very quick uh, when the the reason for the death is very obvious and there's no investigation. But when there is some sort of investigation, or if it doesn't get reported in a timely fashion. It doesn't get entered until the folks in the MUI area enter it. Right. So there's always some time lag here. Hopefully it's not a lot, but we've seen, obviously, uh, you know, uh, we've seen months go by before. I don't know that that's the norm, but we've seen that before. But even if it's two weeks, depending on how, you, how the board of bills, they can easily get quite a few claims paid before ultimately it gets back to the Medicaid system, back to the you know MIPS and our and WMS and all our systems. Uh, let's see. I think that was the only question there. So again, uh, I don't think this is uh, you know too much rocket science, other than actually monitoring it really and, and taking the the time to regularly monitor this, so that you know because at the end of the day it helps you. you it, it it quickens up your audit. It declutters your audit report. You know, because I don't think anybody wants an audit report that, oh, the board billed for something it shouldn't have. That never looks good for anybody, even if it was unintentional, which it almost always is. Um, okay, so that covers those three main claims reports. Those are kind of the, the three reports that are kind of key towards kind of helping you with really the audit process and monitoring kind of the claims and flags of kind of claims issues. The next report I'm going to show and run here is basically going to help with numerous things. Okay, this is called the voucher mounts by contractor. Okay, um, and what this report is going to do is basically it's going to show all basically the roll up of your claim. Okay, so uh, and it's going to structure it in numerous ways that will help you with numerous parts of the cost report. All right, so here, before I get to the prompt page, I think I actually want to show you what the report looks like first, because I think that will actually um, uh, be more beneficial. So when you run this, and let's say you ran it for, um, you know, a, a, a particular date span, what it's going to do is, and actually, maybe I'll do this, um, I think I actually got a save copy in here, and this doesn't show any HIP information, so um, we should be okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually open it up in, in HTML. Um, and I, I can't remember what board I picked. This isn't state secret, so um, and it's, we can show it. But basically what it's going to show here, it's going to structure by, date, by voucher run date, by service program, it's going to show your payments. Okay. So how does that help you as a, as a county board? Well, for one, the first thing is you can reconcile 
and you should be reconciling, every time you get a payment, you know, I would be reconciling it to this because this helps you fill out Schedule C of the cost report in terms of how you're reporting your revenue. You know, you have to report your revenue very many different ways based on, you know, you can't just report, I received 16797 in FFP, right? It's all broken out in the different federal CFDAs. Also, you have to report match separately. So this report will help you, and if you do this on a regular basis, every time you get paid, even by simply having an Excel spreadsheet and running this and putting the amounts in the right columns, you know, it takes you 30 seconds to fill out Schedule C versus trying to figure this out in April of the following calendar year and trying to balance it to what to your actual receipts. To me, that would be a nightmare. So you're able to... Can you show them briefly just where they would go on this page if they wanted to send this HTML page to Excel? Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you run this in, yeah, and that's a good point, yeah. Uh, if you run this in HTML, which is the default, and the reason why it's the default is, again, you can see the blue link, okay? So if you actually want the detailed claims that make up these numbers, that's where you go. You, if you click this, it's going to give you, it's going to give you the detail for this voucher number because you can see they're different. So it's only going to give you the detail for this row. If you click this, it's going to give you the detail for the whole voucher run, okay? So it just depends on what you need. But let's say you, you want this and you want to take this into Excel, which is, which is probably what most of you want to do. If you click up here at this box where it says HTML, it's going to give you View and Excel options. And over here, um, you can click one of these. It's not highlighted for some reason right now, but it, it should be when you run it. And you, can, it, you just pick one of those. CFV will get rid of all the formatting. That's probably what you want. But, um, or you can run it in 07 or whatever, which will keep all the merged cells, which if you're trying to sort and things, you want to do CSV because you know uh, it'll you don't want all the formatting. Otherwise, you'll get all the, the totals and the merged rows and whatnot, which will be a pain in, in your neck for actually sorting the report. Sometimes um, when reports are like this and they have lots of financial information, I like to do the Excel 2000 data option, which is a new one in, 10, in the new Cognos 10.2 because it's similar to the CSV, but then it uh, it knows when it sees money that it's money, and so it saves you a couple steps sometimes. Yeah. But just experiment and see whatever whatever you like, because everybody sort of has a different thing they want to do with this. Um, yeah. So basically, you know, so the first thing is, let's just say this this is perfect. You know, whatever it's perfect. What you want, all you do after you go to the bottom and you have your total. Here's all I received in FFP. Here's all I received in state match. Okay. So, as you know, um, you know. IO level one, you can see there's state match components here, right? Currently, although that may change soon, but currently, you know, we pay you back the, the state match on TCM. That is not FFP. One of the common mistakes I see when we look at these cost reports on Schedule C is everybody takes this total voucher amount and plops it in Schedule C as federal revenue. It is not federal revenue, and that is not the correct accounting of the revenue. Only the FFP column is actual federal revenue. So, in other words, if this was the only payment I received, I would be reporting 16797 of federal revenue in the correct CFDA column, which in Schedule C, it's got TCM and waivers broken out, so I'd have to separate those two. The state match portion for the IO waivers, okay, so anytime we pay state match on an IO waiver, that means it's one of the state-funded waivers. So it might be a Martin waiver, it could be a DC downsizing waiver, could be an ICF uh, to waiver. Um, so anytime you see, see state match here, that is state revenue to you. So that gets reported in under the state revenue column of Schedule C. And there is a spot for that, for DC, for, you know, whatever. Um, so that would go, you'd have to report that under the state revenue column on Schedule C. Then the state match of TCM, that's actually just a return of local money that you've already paid us. That actually does not go on Schedule C as a reconciling item on the county board to on the county auditor reconciliation page. So then you would take these totals and put those in the TCM match line uh, uh, on schedule on the county board to reconciliation uh, worksheet, which it has a line right there for it. So long story short, if 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 on this voucher run date you received all this money and you had an Excel sheet that had those things on it, and you literally just went in here and typed those numbers in, and then when it was time to do your cost report, you opened it up and you plugged in the totals, 
You'd have your traceability back from the auditors. You would know it matches the claims. You would know it matches your auditor's report. And it should take you 30 seconds to put it in that Excel sheet. Instead of all the time of trying to piece all this together at the end, which you can do, this will allow you to do this. However, it would be very time consuming and possibly you're, you know, you're going to have timing issues. You know, this voucher run date of 1-6 isn't when you got paid. That's when we got ran the vouchers. You might have got paid, you know, let's pretend the voucher run date was 12-30. Well, it'll say 12-30-13 on our report, but you got paid in 1-6-14, which is a different cost reporting period. So unless you're keeping a, a, a worksheet that helps you track the timing differences, you know, it can be very difficult or at least time consuming to then figure out, well, I got paid for this here and it's on this year in the claims, but I got paid the next year. It's just going to save you a lot of heartache and heartburn and be really easy for an auditor or for you or anyone, your predecessor um, or successor, I should say, to follow how things are reported if you were to implement something like that. Okay? So, long story short, this this is this report, in my opinion, is invaluable for making that part easier and making it accurate. Um, and you, again, you can see the detail if you need to see the detail. Um, another thing um, along this report, okay, so this is the grand total. Now, as I was talking to er, as I was talking to you earlier, that's why I want to show you the prompt page last, which is kind of um, different from the way we would regular do things. Is you, know, you, also, you also receive S-CHIP funds, which is a different CFDA than regular Medicaid, okay? Each claim gets a, a S-CHIP flag on the claim, okay? So you're able to do two things, okay? So if you want to run this report for S-CHIP only, you can click this button, yes, do your, do your time spans, and it's going to return only the amount that had the S-CHIP flag on it. So again, you're able to isolate your S-CHIP dollars easily and accurately simply by clicking that button and running this report. Same for include state match. Let's say you wanted to handle the state match just as a separate thing. If you wanted to do that, you just can click this button and it's going to give you only payments that had state match on it. That way you could isolate those if you wanted to be able to deal with those separately. It all depends on how you view the, um, you know, what the easiest method for you to get the Schedule C reporting correct. Well, it looks like you have a question. Oh, I do have a question. Let's see. Um, so the question is, we have a few instances where this report says that the FFP amount is more than the vouchered amount, but the FFP amount is actually what was vouchered. Is that just a mistake? Um, I'd have to see the uh, if maybe you could send me um, an example. And I, I can see what county you are, so I should probably run it if I have found it. Typically, when we see anything like that, it has to do with an adjustment, or it has to do, usually it's an adjustment of a, uh, a prior year period where the match rates were different. So when they do it, it when it goes through MITS, it, it basically, the service date doesn't matter. It's whatever the FFP rate is at the time. Um, so if there's a change, and this is usually, it's it, it very rare for this to ever happen, but I've seen it happen, and obviously it's happened to, to this person. The only time I've ever seen it really happen is, was usually around the EF map periods where the rates were significantly different. So somebody went in and adjusted a claim currently where the match was very low in the EF map period, um, and then it goes through the systems today, um, and the, rate, the match rate's much higher, it can cause some very goofy, goofy things to occur, and it can cause the FFP amount, and the ma it can cause negative FFP amounts or negative match amounts. That's usually what it is. Um, however, I'll, I'll research. They just sent me the county, and um, yeah, and we can, um, you know, look into the actual detail because I'd have to look at the detail of the claim, um, which I can't bring up here because it would show everybody everything. And I don't know if this is for this situation or not. But sometimes you see the voucher amount is less than the total amount when the waiver is a state-funded waiver, and you are not receiving match for the waiver. Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the, the, the voucher amount, in theory, again, short of any kind of error, should always be what you're paid, okay, um, you know, in every instance as a provider. The reimbursed amount, um, and sometimes, I, I, and probably in the case that they're asking the state and federal share, sometimes can be some sort of error or some sort of miscalculation. 
but typically the reimbursed amount is always the 100% value. But in theory, when you're looking at what you actually got paid, it should always be the voucher amount. The day programs, too, like Russ mentioned that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in the day programs, because you only get the FFP on, on the payment. But we'll look into this particular county that they sent us in the date, and we can, we'll can we'll respond directly. And if there's anything else that has a bigger, you know, a bigger meaning to, to everyone, we'll communicate that. Um, let's see, and I think we might have a drill through. But again, the drill through is the same, um, you know, in terms of uh, what you saw before. It just shows you the detail for that payment. Uh, and yeah, okay, it looks like uh, I don't see any other questions on that. Um, so the last one I want to go into is, uh, again, we're going to go into the individual daily summary folder. And this is going to be your uh, acuity um, report, okay? One of the things we see all the time, and all, I mean all the time, is folks who don't think they have people in acuity A1, but they really do because they made a mistake in the AAI instrument, the acuity instrument, when they were putting people's uh, acuity scores in. So as probably many of you know, and those that you don't know, basically AI is the system that boards would enter acuity information to determine you know, what ratio band they're in for day services. Now A and A1 technically have the same score uh, in the system, it's just that you know, our rules allow you to serve those people in either a 1 to 16 or a 1 to 12 ratio. But when you go through the AI, at the very end, there's a box that pops up, and I'm, I'm not an expert on it. But basically, if you check the box, you know, it puts you in an A1 versus if you don't check it, it puts you in an A. So we've seen many, 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 many mistakes on accident when people are entering these instruments and then checking the box and unintentionally putting folks in an A1 acuity band. Okay, so... What does that mean? Well, what it means is when you bill that person for an A, the system isn't going to air it out. It's only going to pay you an A1 rate. So if you're not reconciling, that's why the previous report I just showed you is very important. If you're not reconciling what you got paid to what you think you got, got paid, many of you that have these errors are getting paid A1 rates on A's and you're, you're not getting what you should get. Okay? So what you need to do is, for one, correct it. Okay? Not only in our AI system, but my understanding is many of you might correct it. Uh, you think when you correct it in your gatekeeper or whatever system you use, that that, you know, because when we find these things, the emails that get back say, oh, no, I checked my system, and they're all A's. Well, your systems don't matter when it comes to billing. The state systems matter. So you have to make sure that your, your local systems are linked, synced up with the state system. So... Lots of times folks um, fix it in their gatekeeper or whatever other software is out there, but not the state system. And guess what? Unfortunately, that means you get paid on the state system, not what your local system says. So with this report, at the end of the day, what it does is, I'm going to show you the prompt page. And I think there's a prompt page. If not, I'm going to kill it real fast so I don't show anything. Basically, again, I, I, this, will, this will pop up, but in theory, you should even if you just hit finish, it's not going to do anything because you can only see what you can see. That's really for probably state users and people who have access to multiple counties to be able to pick. But basically, so that's really the only prompt. Okay, so I'm going to show you the, the detail here. Um, basically, what it's going to show is just right here. It's going to show you anybody who has an A1 ratio, who they are, and um, and the ratio. Okay, so and th and this one's keyed off the previous day. All right. So in other words, you, what you can do, if you wanted, is you could schedule this report to run every day or once a week or, or whatever, once a month, um, and automatically be emailed to somebody. And it will show you anybody as of the previous day that had an A1 acuity. So in theory, if I set this up to run, to automatically email to myself or to an SSA or to whoever would monitor this, every day I should expect that report to be blank. And if it isn't blank and somebody shows up on the report, that means I ha I, it just happened yesterday. I can go in and fix it before there's any time or any, any risk of billing incorrectly and having to go fix claims, having to do all this. Okay? That's why I would suggest you do this at least weekly, if not monthly, I guess, if, or daily, depending, I guess, again, on your billing cycle. 
only because I, I would want to catch these before I ever bill the incorrect ratio because I don't want to be backing out claims and all the headache that goes with all that stuff. So again, it's a tool for you to monitor if the ratio were not, you, you know, if somebody made a mistake or it's wrong in some sort of system, okay? Again, if you don't have A1s and this comes back blank, that means you're good. There, are, As of the previous day, there is nobody with A1s. But if it does show somebody, that means somebody has the A1 ratio. If they shouldn't or you don't do A1 um, in your county, then someone needs to go into AI and fix fix it so that you don't have any problems when you bill. So, it's, I mean, that's, that's, that's really all this report does. It's really a tool just to know. Um, and it's a simple thing where, you you know, if you have access, you can go over here and schedule it, save it in your folder, schedule it, whatever, you know, and you can have it to run. And I'll just kind of give you a brief, brief walk through just for fun. Um, you can go, let's just say I want to do this. I could say by day, run every day, and I, you know, you can set whatever I want it to run, you know, in Excel 07, and this is, you won't, you shouldn't need to do this, but I'll just say, it, I'm just going to say it's this county, and I'm not really going to do this, but, um, yeah, and then no end date, which means it's going to run every day. Um, you, you know, you click this where it says send a link to the report by email, so this would be, let's say, I, let's say, um, Let's say you have 15 SSAs that you don't want in the data warehouse running reports every day just to look at this. You know, you could go here, get all their emails, blah, 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 type all their emails in. You know, I'll put, you know, A1 security report. Now, what I always do is always attach the report. Don't just send a link because if you send a link, it will make them sign in and do all this stuff. I wouldn't bother with that. Just attach the report. And what that will do is I hit, I hit, uh, so uh, at the top where it has my name under the two, it will automatically populate your name and user ID in there. I would suggest that you not trust it to do that and to go ahead and delete that out and put in your actual email address because sometimes email addresses change or sometimes um, user IDs are not linked to the right address you want. And so uh, if, if you go ahead and type in an actual email address, it's always going to get to the, the right person. And we have uh, saved in other webinars, and we also have some handouts that you can download from the website on how to schedule a report. And so if you didn't get all of this today and you want to watch one of those, we have some, some trainings on scheduling reports where we go a lot more slowly and sort of focus on just the scheduling part of it. And for those of you who like to join us on webinars, we'll be practicing scheduling the pause confirmation report, but the steps are um, for any kind of report you want to schedule. We'll do that webinar in a couple weeks on May 13th in the morning on a Wednesday. So if you'd like to join us for that, you're more than welcome. So, you know, what, the good thing about this is, and what I'm, what I'm trying to show here is, if you put, you don't have to have a two, like, you know, as Hope said, you know, if you don't want to get it and you're just scheduling it, you, that can be blank. For me, because we have a lot of schedule reports here, I always want to receive a copy. So I always leave my stuff in here for, this is just what I do. Um, I always have my email first and I put anybody I want it to go to. So in this case, what's beautiful about this is I just put in some emails here. All, all three of these people, in this case, don't even need access to the data warehouse. They're going to get an email with, a, with an attached Excel document and the email is going to have whatever I put in here. So, like, for example, I put A1 acute report, should not have anybody. If someone shows up, please correct in AI. Okay? So they're going to get an email that says A1 acute report, should not have anyone. If someone shows up, please correct in AI. It's going to have an attachment with the Excel sheet. The thing about running it uh, every day is if somebody gets that and they know it's their responsibility, they go in and fix it. In theory, they should get the same email tomorrow and it should be blank. If it's not blank, either the, either the, the correction didn't take or something else went wrong. So then they can go back again and do it until that thing is blank. That gives you built-in accountability, it's, uh, it's, and no one has to have access, no one has to do anything, okay? It's, you know, and you could do that for any report in theory, right? This is just one that I think fits for a lot of folks. Um, I'm going to hit cancel, but the key thing here is that, like Hope and Laurel said, go out and check the other tools, but I always attach the report that just gets you out of having people to actually have access. It's just like somebody sent them an email and it has an, an Excel document attached.
And basically, you can set you can set the end date. Then once you're done with that, you just hit OK, and it'll be saved until you go, you know, uh, fix it. And if you ever go back and you want to stop it, you just hit disable the schedule. It will stop it. And let's say you wanted to do it only on business days. You know, you could do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You know, and leave Saturday, Sundays off. It just depends. You can you can do whatever you want to do. You could do by month. You know, which it's you, you know the fourth Wednesday. A lot of options there. So this is really something that I think not just for this report, but in general, and how you think about how you want to use the data warehouse and how it can really make things more efficient and more accountable, this is one of the biggest ways you can do that, is through these scheduling reports and blasting out emails without anybody ever having to really know how to do anything, frankly, in terms of how to use the data warehouse. So I'm just going to hit cancel because I don't, wanna, I don't actually want to do that. Um, so those are the main reports that we have right now for cost report preparation. Um, but you know, like I said, I'm always trying to think of ones that would be helpful. Um, you know, if you guys have certain things that you know the data exists in our systems and would be helpful for cost report, or for that matter, for anything, you know, we want to hear about it. Cost report specifically, you can contact me. But obviously, you know, contact our, through our data warehouse stuff, um, Hope Laurel I, or uh, any of the you know through the website um, as well. Uh, and you know, we'll have to put that on our list, and um, you know, try to get there. Is there any other, is there any questions about these reports, um, how they function? I know I have a tendency to talk really fast, um, or also any other questions about data warehouse in general that we can answer. We still got you know 15 minutes here of our time. If uh, there are some, we'd be happy to try to um, answer them. Uh, here's one. Okay, it says, are MAC reports up to date? Okay, I think the question you must be referring to the uh, the cost by person MAC reports for the cost report. Um, yeah, they should be uh, available. Uh, my understanding is that those are now available via the actual RMTS website, so which I think your coordinator and assistant coordinator have access to. So you should be able to go in there and run your report for calendar year 14. Um, and uh, it should be there. If you have any issues or it's not there, let me know, and I can get with Beth, and we can figure that out. But that's my understanding. Um, and lo okay, it looks like actually somebody confirmed that we're actually able to um, um, uh, run some uh, data or for private providers on non-medical transportation. So kind of confirming what we talked about earlier. Um, oh, okay, and then the. Follow up to the MAC question was it was it was missing last quarter and uh, yeah that's a good point actually it, it I'm not sure if it has all the quarters in there which is my why it might be missing it I believe they were just finishing up the last quarter um, last week so if it's not there now it should be up there very very soon so sorry I apologize I thought you were asking how to how to access it not if it had all the quarters in there so yeah I think it I, it should be there very soon I'm not 100 percent certain if they if they've finish that claim for that quarter yet, but I know if it's not there now, it will be very soon. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know, if you didn't know already, that uh, this Friday we're doing two face-to-face -face trainings at the Columbus Developmental Center. The morning session, as of right now, is completely full. Uh, we've had some cancellations and shuffling about and that sort of thing. So in the afternoon, we actually have, I think, three openings right now. Uh, we're going to be focusing primarily on financial type reporting, although we will do whatever anybody wants to do when we get there. Um, so basically, we want you to come with questions and ideas. And we have, I think, you know, if you guys know Laurel and I, we, we could talk for like, what, like a week or so on various things. So um, we come with ideas, but you can, you can narrow it down a bit. And so, but for me, if any of you would like to have some, uh, report, hand holding time, uh, someone looking over your shoulder, seeing what you're, you know, if you're doing the right thing, uh, ask lots of questions, uh, learn how to, you know, schedule some reports, learn how to run the various financial reports, uh, then we would love to see you there on Friday. Um, stop by our website for the link or look in your email, because if you knew about this, then you probably knew about those as well but the, the link should be in your email 
for how to register for the trainings on Friday. And then if you can't come to the one on Friday, next month we have two more that will be at the, uh, the State Library of Ohio. And so those are going to be a little bit bigger sessions because we, we uh, thought that the, we had thought the small group of eight thing would be great and personal and stuff, but I think it, we actually realized, you know. You guys are just so good that um, we feel like we can do a bigger group. Mm -hmm. And also, it seems like people learn a lot from each other in these trainings. So we like to get as many people uh, into the room as possible. Any other questions or um, anything to note? All right. See none. We appreciate you attending. If you have any follow-up questions, you know, just contact one of us, and um, we'll try to get back to you. We appreciate um, you taking the time to come listen.